Hello and welcome to Corleone Further Inside. My name is Eric Light. I am the artistic director of Corleone Men's Choir in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I am so thrilled to talk to somebody that I've never spoken to before. Uh, composer Melissa Dunphy. Hello, Melissa. Hello, I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. Uh, it's one of the great things, I keep saying this about this show is, and and one of the only silver linings of the pandemic is, uh, it's forced me to talk to people I've been wanting to chat with. And uh, usually they're at home, so you, you catch them and it's it's uh, it, it, it kind of works. Yeah, for sure. No, it's amazing that, you know, I hate not being in the same room as people, um, but I probably would not be able to fly to Vancouver and be in the same room as you. So, hey. <laughs> hey. Well, gl I'm, gl I'm glad I'm glad you're here. Can you um, tell us a little bit about your your biography? What's what's appearing on the on the Melissa Dumphy biography? Sure. Okay. So I am uh, dialing in here from Philadelphia, sunny Philadelphia. Not so sunny today, no, but okay. uh, <laughs> but originally, as you may be able to tell from my totally mangled accent, I grew up in Australia. Uh, so uh, grew up where in, in Brisbane. Australia. Brisbane. I was born Brisbane. and raised mostly in Brisbane, and then I lived in Sydney for six years. Uh, and then I tell people I had the uh, the the misfortune, maybe in my early twenties, of falling in love with an American. Uh, we're still <laughs> we're still very happily married, so that part is lucky. Um, twenty twenty, not such a lucky year, mm. like generally for America. But uh, I moved to America, um, yeah, uh, when I was twenty three. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had always been a musician as a kid, but I didn't make music my career until after I got married and I came to the United States. Wow. I, yeah, I tried a ton of other careers. I actually, I started a medical school degree straight out of school, um, realized I was going to be the world's most miserable doctor and quit. Uh, and then I've had that doctor, by the way. Oh, yeah. they, you don't want like I, yeah. yeah, I would have killed people <laughs> with how miserable I was. Uh, I just didn't have the calling. Um, and then I bounced around a bunch of other uh, professions. I worked in a law firm for a while. I worked in TV production. I worked selling wine over the phone for a telemarketing company. I worked in IT um, and all the time doing music on the side. And mm -hmm. it wasn't until I came to America and by total chance, I got an opportunity to write music for a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream that I was acting in. I'm also a big oh. theater person. Um, and uh, while I was composing the songs, you know, A Midsummer Night's Dream has a ton of songs in it. Um, I started writing the songs and I had this epiphany. Oh my God, this is what I want to do with my life. Like right. I finally found what it is and it's composition. Uh, so I, you know, went to Google and typed in how to, <laughs> to become be a composer. <laughs> that should also be like a, a text for a piece that you write is just whatever comes Sorry. out on that Google search. But anyway, right. yeah. How to be a composer. Because yeah. I really had no idea. Uh, I was 24. <laughs> I didn't have a bachelor's degree. And all of the information was like, you probably need to go to grad school. So I sort of thought, well okay, now is the time to start my bachelor's degree. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, my schooling went community college first because I was poor and could not pay for, <laughs> for a nice for fancy private requisite school. Co yep, yep. Right? Classes, yep. Um, then transferred to a state school just outside of Philadelphia, Westchester University, where I got my Bachelor of Music and then got straight into the PhD program at the University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League, big deal, um, and uh, finished my PhD there. Um, and along the way, you know, I kept writing vocal music. I think right. it's the thing that I come back to again and again. Um, and, you know, like, like with people who write words, one of the things that I, I believe is, you know, you write what you know and you write the things that make you feel, the things that inspire you, the things that give you really strong emotions. Uh, so as someone who moved to America during the George W. Bush administration and uh, saw firsthand all of the differences between America and out other, you know, westernized countries outside of America, yeah. uh, politics and social justice issues were things that made me, you know, really angry 
I tell people mm -hmm. this all the time. Uh, anger is a really good engine for creative work. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, you know? yeah. Um, and also, you know, uh, there were moments of hope, moments of um, of happiness, even moments of uh, of just desire to change things. So now I uh, have a. Oh, I'm very lucky to have a pretty active freelance career as a composer, mostly writing choral and vocal works, um, either with a political social justice bent or like a theatrical bent, because I still love theater. Right. And yeah, I've noticed that on your bios that you have that that theater background. Um, I want to I want to ask and and while you are definitely having a wonderful career in the choral world, that's certainly not your only uh, outlet. I mean, I think we're living in a world right now where there are the choral composers and that is like kind of what they do and that's and that's wonderful. Uh, but you've kind of, <laughs> and uh, speaking about your, 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 your bio, you kind of have this polymath aspect where theatrical aspects of, are entering into that. Where do you see those other influence from outside violins, a part of your life, all the rest of that? Where where do those other interests of, of your life, aside from maybe the political social justice things, where do those come into uh, how you're approaching composition, how you're approaching the projects, how you're finding the text and, and then the sounds of the music itself? For sure. Um, they they have I, I sort of I'm one of these people who sort of feels like everything you do has an impact on the art that you create yeah. as an artist, you know? Um, so for instance, um, you know, the theater side of things, for me growing up as a kid in Australia, the thing that I was most interested in uh, theatrically was Shakespeare. Um, oh. I was a real nerdy kid, so Shakespeare was my jam. Uh, and I think- I don't think I've talked to anybody on this show that wasn't a nerdy kid, just <laughs> <Okay>. FYI, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you have to be a little... I should rename the show, frankly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nerdy kids growing up. Nerdy yeah. kids doing choral music. Hey. Nerdy kids. Where are they now? <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Um, so, uh, you know, I feel like you can't be a Shakespearean nut unless you're really in love with language. Yeah. And uh, so... Yeah, I've always loved language. I've always, you know, I've loved literature. I've loved poetry. And uh, so coming to, you know, all of my music in some ways has a kind of a language component. Like even, even my, you know, violin music and my chamber music, a lot of it has uh, a language component either overtly as like a spoken word thing that goes ah. with a, a, a string trio yeah. or, you know, the title itself becomes part of the composition because mm -hmm. I, you know, I choose the titles very carefully or it's based on a song or a poem or something sure. like that. Um, so this is probably, you know, so it has those extra referential points to, to sure. another, another entry points for the audience, for you as for your own inspiration, for the performers, etc. Yeah. I, Definitely. I, I always yeah. thought, I always so appreciate uh, the, the the more avenues you have into a piece, I think the the the, the more interesting that is. Uh, oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's definitely paid off in that, um, you know, there is nothing wrong with writing string quartet number four and G minor, you know, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. And I love music, some of which has purely musical inspiration, like purely harmonic or purely melodic inspiration. But for me, I think as someone who has um, a, a wide range of interests, it feels so natural to write music about something, whether that's mm -hmm. about a text or about an issue, about a person. Um, and then what happens, as you say, is people in the audience who aren't you know, the kind of person who would sit down and analyze string quartet number four, number four in G minor yeah. <laughs> will come to a concert or come to a show because they have an interest in science or they, and they're really interested to see what art comes out of science, you know, or they're really mm -hmm. interested in uh, the biography of a certain person, or they're interested in a political issue or, you know, and I think a lot of choral music people will go to a, a choral concert because it's on a theme. You know what I mean? Or yeah. it has like, it's about something mm -hmm. other than these beautiful harmonic melodies, you yeah. know, those kinds of things. Um, so that's like me personally. I would never say nobody should write music that's about, you know, a chord. 
Right. But but for me, that's definitely yeah where I get my kicks as a composer. That's um, it's so interesting, and one of the things that then that makes me really appreciative about your music is that um, you have social justice themes, you have external um, uh, sources and inspirations, and uh, and and a lot of times timeliness of the things that you're writing about. As you know, as you're saying, you're you're being. Uh, really inspired in the moment or angry in the moment about what is going on. Tell me a little bit about how you balance, or do you even think about this at all, the timeliness of the piece of music that you're writing versus its timelessness. Uh -huh. And 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 do you care about that? Or is it about getting out uh, that, that thing uh, in your heart and on your mind uh, in, in, in that moment? Or do you care about things being relevant or even understandable 20 years from now? Sure. Uh, so I have a pretty, um, it may be a controversial opinion for some people, I don't know. It is my personal opinion that uh, the idea of timelessness for music is kind of a load of hooey. Mm -hmm. I'm being polite. It's kind of a load of... <laughs> What word? Like, Hooey. <laughs> Malarkey, okay, I think. Is Malark the word. <laughs> oh, yes. Tomfoolery. Yes. yes, that's right. Um, because, you know, I think even the compositions that we think of as timeless now in the 21st century, looking yep. back to the classical period, the Baroque period, were not timeless, actually. You know, they weren't timeless at all. They were framing issues that were important to them in the moment. Um, and some of those issues, you know, we're not even cognizant of when we listen to the music, but the composer was writing about them, you know, the composer put them in there. Um, so I feel like this issue of, you know, and it's a big one, like classical music is timeless, you know, is, is something that sort of uh, was imposed upon music at right. some point my guess is in the late romantic period that sounds about the right 20th yes. century yeah. right yeah. um yeah so it's something that i push back on a little bit because mm -hmm. then it puts this weird pressure on us as composers to imagine that our music is still being played 300 years into the future you know like like mozart's music like bach's right. music right. and so we have this idea that you know the the sort of <laughs> somewhat derisive way I, I talk about it is like as choral composers we feel like we should all be writing songs about stars and clouds and sunsets be, and forests because and the sea because these things are timeless so we imagine like if we just stick to these topics then that is what people in the 24th century might want to listen to because hopefully there'll still be stars trees and yeah <laughs> That's right. Maybe. And, right, right, right. It's, I know. Because then it's like, actually, if you write things about the sea, it is political, right? Because everything in the end is political. Uh -huh. Even the decision to not engage overtly with politics is a political decision. Absolutely. So for me, um, you know, I, I sort of decided early on in my career that I didn't have much of an interest in feeding into the the myth of timelessness as a composer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to write things, uh, write music about things that are of this moment. Um, and maybe it will still be relevant hundreds of years into the future. If so, I guess I'm a lucky composer. I'll be dead, so I won't know it. But, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, that's, that would be great. I would love that. Right. Um, but in the meantime, uh, especially at this moment in the 21st century, when there are, the world feels very urgent. So many things Absolutely. in the world feel very urgent politically uh, to do with the climate, to do with social justice issues that have been plaguing us for you know hundreds of years. Um, to not engage with those very current issues feels like sort of a privileged cop out in some ways mm -hmm. for me. Um, because as an artist, if I'm not working to make the world better, what am I doing? What, what is, what is right. even the point of what I'm doing? Uh, so, you know, there are some pieces that I've written, and uh, we're going to hear one of them, actually, that I almost, I, I, not even almost, I hope to see the day 
when the piece becomes irrelevant because sure. the issue that I'm writing about is has been solved for the better. And, uh, you know, in a hundred years time, people will go, wow, can you believe people were writing music about this issue? Like what a strange time that was. It's a historical, you know, a, 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 right. a period piece. Right. Um, I long for that. Um, I really do because the point of the piece is to raise awareness and change things. So yeah, now. that's how, that's why I approach yeah. things. Exactly. To change yeah. things now. Um, I actually, you know, I like I said, I feel like there are so many pieces that we think of as timeless that you dig into it a little bit and you're like, actually, this piece was about like this very uh, uh, current political conflict that was happening like in Mozart's court, you know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. And and I, um, I mean, how many weeks and days of our lives in the, let's say in the last eight months, have we, have we, I, I get to Friday and I go, I, this week was history. Like, like yeah. I just lived inside of history. We're going to really talk about what happened in this time. Um, and why are we, then why are, how do I then make what I'm doing in my, in my job, which is being an artist and, and selecting these things. How do, how do I make this relevant uh, into, into now? Um, and, uh, and, and I think we're, I think we, 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 we lack the, the idea that we're, we are always a part of history, but I have to say, I've just been feeling that so much more intensely, uh, in the last few months, uh, with COVID and God knows everything else that's been going on. Very much so. Very, very much so. Yeah. Um, I, you brought up something earlier and it was actually a question that I really wanted to, to ask you, um. You're talking about choirs singing about trees and stars and you know all all of all of those things, which are they're fine. Uh, but are there are there aspects when you're writing? Let's say you're writing an opera, or you're writing a solo art song, or then you're writing a choral piece. Are there things that each one of those elements that still have text involved in them and still have singing? Are there are there topics or or uh, modes of expression that are particular to uh, to that to that genre? And I guess especially when you think about choral music, are there things that it does really well? Do you see that there are limits? Um, are there places that we should be uh, pushing further to be, uh, to find the expressive elements in in choral music? Sure, uh, great question. Um, so. Out of, you know, the three vocal genres that you mentioned, art song, opera, choral music, which is sort of the three main things. Oratorio, that, sort of a little different. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Like in, in that uh, yeah. vein. Um, I feel, for me, one of the reasons that I keep coming back again and again to choral music is I feel like choral music has a really unique ability to... Um, to unlock a kind of community feeling that the other yes. ones don't so much. Yes. So this is, of course, uh, at the primary level with the choir itself. And there's research that shows that if you it sing a in a choir, it, yeah. right, it, it's, it's an organism. It's yeah, And it yeah, changes yeah. your brain. Like it yeah. changes the brains of the individual people yeah. in the choir to make them think more about community, which God knows is something that we need more and more yeah. of as we sort of get deeper into the 21st century with all of these attendant problems. Um, so, you know, that's like the, the, the first thing. Um, there's something so magical about a group of people that have chosen to come together and breathe together and sing words together and cooperate using just the instrument that is on board with their body, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it's why I do so much a cappella choral work because, uh, you know, I love pianists, I love instrumentalists, <laughs> but it's like, as soon as right. you bring them into the mix, it, it, mix, it just changes, it the, changes uh, the, the algorithm a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so there's, there's something really special about uh, about watching a choir from the audience bring this message out and do it really well so you can see a choir is working together. It makes you part of that community too. It brings you in. Yeah. Uh, my husband always teases me because whenever I go to a choir concert, I start automatically breathing with the choir. <laughs> So when the conductor goes like this and the choir takes a big breath in, I'm always like, <laughs> in my... <laughs> and 
were like, of- don't stand up too fast. You'll pass <laughs> out know. from yeah, you know, <laughs> hyperventilation. Like, some of it is from being a musician myself, but some of it is also like as human beings, you know, when we see people breathe, we start to become in sync Absolutely. with them. Um, so something that I have found, particularly with my social justice uh, uh, topics that I've covered in my choir music, is that people who might not be very uh, open to a message if they heard it, I don't know, coming out of the mouth of someone on C-SPAN or something or, or, you know, a lecture or read the words on a Facebook wall or something like that and and would immediately get very defensive and uh, and react with, with, you know, negative emotions. Can hear that same message in a choir environment, in a choral concert environment and not immediately view it as an attack or as you know something that was right. totally uh, uh, denigrating what they do but see the humanity behind that opinion that message and maybe start to understand why people believe that message um, and I've had that happen like a couple of times like a number of times where I've had people come up to me and say after a choir concert wow, that made me think about this issue in a way that I've never thought about it before. Um, And, you know, I I just, I I feel in my bones, I don't have scientific evidence, but I feel in my bones that choir music does this like more easily and more effectively. It has a certain power, yes. I think there's also like when you see 60 people that you know they've all worked for weeks on this and they've all decided to commit their bodies, their souls, their hearts to a message. You can't argue with that versus if I tell you, you should do this or you should do that. That's just my opinion. But that shared opinion is, is, I think is, uh, there's something about that too, that this many people have decided to, um, to come together and, and, and say something, uh, that is, that's very, very powerful and, and hard to argue against. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a it's it's the reason why uh, why church choirs are a thing, right? It's like it's that same thing that you're tapping into the sense of community and the sense of like hearing a message and and understanding the humanity behind that message. Um, you know, I've written some sacred music as well, but I feel like that power should not just be restricted to religious environments. It should, you know, this is such a powerful medium. It's so powerful. Um, it makes people, it just brings people's defenses down. You know, yeah. I, I, I completely agree. And I think um, you, you touch on something that is, I think, really important to me, especially working in a relatively secular uh, Vancouver area. Um, that that sort of unique power of the spirituality of of a choir, and maybe maybe we have you know thousands of years of history behind that, and we're sort of that's what we think of. Right. But I do think there is there is something that it touches on, um, For sure. especially in the a cappella music. There's a reason why all of those composers decided to use the human voice uh, in that way uh, way back when uh, that the chicken was before the egg, or so yeah, to speak. Yeah, I, I believe it. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting to me how um, that. Uh, that uh, that that power and that ability is now being used in um, uh, to express other uh, other thoughts and uh, and ideas, and I find that to be so uh, this to be such an exciting time, uh, if not a trying time, it's an exciting time to be to be making music. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you uh, so much for uh, for speaking with us. I could I could do this all day, um, and uh, it's just uh, lovely to hear. Uh, your perspective. Um, before we go, what's next? What do you? What do you? How are you getting through this pandemic? What do you? What are you doing? Well, I tell people I'm. I feel really, really lucky because it's all just luck and timing, right? If this pandemic had happened five years ago, I don't know how I would have survived through it. But I'm lucky that my career kind of got to a point right at the beginning of 2020 where. Um, to put it bluntly, it's like I ha- I'm big enough that the commissions are still coming in. I don't know when they're ever going to get performed <laughs> because everything is right up in the air. But, you know, people have seen the work that I've done and they've been still reaching out to me to have me write music for them and sort of 
squirrel away until such a time right. as we can all sing together again. Um, the big one, of course, is Oberlin Conservatory is has commissioned me to write an opera, a whole Ooh. opera. So that'll be well, premiered in 2023. Done. Yeah, it's a big deal. I'm really excited about it. Um, it's an archaeology opera, a topic that I uh, also have some interest in as an amateur archaeologist when I'm not a composer. Uh, and so that's like, like I said, it's it's luck and it's a gift as an artist to have a long-term project under my belt sustaining me through, you know, what is very unstable time. My heart goes out to artists that um, are not in this situation right now. I um, really, my heart goes out to them. I, I want to know ways to, that we can all support them and get us Absolutely. through to the other side. Um, but yeah, I think I'm fingers crossed i shouldn't jinx myself like this yeah. but it's like i think i'm gonna be okay as I long think... as civilization doesn't fall apart yes and... <laughs> and i hope not uh and uh, again i think proof of in, that it's not going to completely unravel is the fact that uh you're uh, someone like you is doing such great work and, and and so many people are 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 getting on board with that and want to support and be and be a part of the the the, the world that you're creating so thank you for all thank you Thank you so much. And thank you for doing things like this to keep the community going, even when we can't be around each other in person. I think it's really great. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.